the ocean is vast and the potential for countries to benefit from its energy is immense. Ocean energy contributes to the world's sustainable development as it reduces dependence on fossil fuels and mitigates the negative impacts of climate change while generating jobs. A source of energy essential for the economic development, sustainability and quality of life. As well as supplying utility scale electricity, it can be used for different applications, including the production of drinking water, and is a great opportunity for islands and many countries that rely on oil imports for electricity generation. This is still an emerging industry. Installation and operation in an open sea environment pose significant challenges to the sector. Therefore, through international collaboration, excellent progress is being made to ensure that ocean energy becomes competitive with other energy sources. Diversification of renewables is needed to meet the decarbonization targets of 2050. The OES, a technology collaboration program of the International Energy Agency, presents a common approach that encourages the development of the sector, seeking a significant improvement of economic and environmental outcomes. And it invites all. Governments, agencies, research organizations, knowledge centers, companies, and individuals to engage in strategic development and innovation activities. Formulating supportive policies for the development and deployment of large-scale ocean energy systems. Making it a cost-effective and reliable low-carbon source of energy generation for the whole world. Hi, everybody. Uh, good morning, uh, good uh, afternoon, good evening. Uh, we are very pleased uh, that you are attending uh, this webinar, uh, since uh, we know that more than 200 people recorded already to, uh, to, 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 to watch this, uh, the, 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 uh, to watch uh, the, the people of our panel, which will be uh, talking about uh, and will be giving a notion energy outlook uh, for Europe. And uh, um, so uh, I will just make a short introduction after this uh, about uh, what um, the, the TCP technology collaboration program uh, on STEMS is all about. And, and then I will give the floor to our talented panel. So uh, I'm Jan Hervé de Roc, I'm the, the, the chairman of uh, this uh, uh, group of experts. And um, what, we, what we are actually dealing with when we are talking about ocean energy is uh, all the sources of energy that are related to the, the, the physical powers, uh, the, the physical potential of the ocean. And uh, uh, so that's why we, yeah, mostly decide about uh, uh, tidal currents and uh, and uh, and wave energy, but we are also dealing with uh, tidal range, uh, with thermal gradient and, and salinity gradient. As I said, with international international experts. So um, 24 countries are, are represented and the European Commission too. And uh, in, in, in this set, and we, we, we discuss about, um, uh, and we work together, together uh, on how uh, these sources of energy can uh, supply electricity, but not just. And uh, so it can be also um, used for heating, cooling, and even for uh, direct use like uh, as i said we're just talking about physical uh, physical power of the ocean so that's to say that we're not uh, talking with uh, uh, biofuels that could be uh, that could come from 
Now, um, we are uh, dividing our work into uh, a set of tasks, and uh, some of them are long-lasting, some of them are on, on a given period, and some of them are just a nascent one, like, uh, for instance, uh, the, 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 the 15th one, Alternative Markets on Ocean Energy. I guess you will hear a little bit about this also in the talks this afternoon. Uh, so, as you can see, I won't enumerate all of them, uh, but uh, we are dealing both with the technical issues, with some uh, regulatory uh, and legal issues. Uh, uh, what we really uh, want to achieve is, is a, a real worldwide benchmark uh, on this topic and share, uh, uh, of course, the best practices and share the, the, the knowledge to really inform um, every, every country, in every country, uh, the stakeholders interested in ocean energy. And, and we want to really proceed in this. Um, about the task I didn't mention, uh, there are some on numerical modeling, both on wave and tidal, uh, a very important task also on the potential environmental effects and uh, that, that, that can have uh, these, uh, uh, these converting systems and uh, how to monitor that. Well, um, I just want to point out what are our latest publications, because, of course, uh, the goal of our work is to be publicized and, 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 and to be um, disseminated as much as possible. So, um, as I was talking about environment, uh, every four years, uh, there's a state of science report, and the last one is a very recent one. I am you really in looking at it. Um, uh, as uh, I was uh, uh, talking about uh, new opportunities, there's uh, this report on blue economy and its promising markets for ocean energy, and among which also uh, there is uh, this focus on ocean energy in islands and remote coastal areas. So these are uh, two important uh, uh, um, booklets uh, if, if you want to get more hints about it. And uh, something that uh, is becoming a worldwide reference uh, to, in order to really um, have a common basis for assessing the level of maturity of, of systems, and both for uh, uh, finances, but also for developers to uh, perform things in a pertinent and coherent. Um, we have this uh, uh, international uh, framework uh, for energy technology. Uh, it's a, an evaluation and guidance. And uh, we have uh, talked together uh, in order to set up um, uh, criteria and thresholds that are then to be worldwide recognized in order to assess the maturity of system. So this afternoon, this afternoon, uh, I have the great pleasure of, having, uh, with, with, uh, of welcoming uh, our panel, uh, which is the uh, first of three of the delegates, and, and then also a representative of the Ocean uh, Energy uh, Syndicate. And um, we've chosen just three countries uh, in Europe, uh, because as you might know, there's a lot of activity around ocean energy in Europe. And so this year we will we focus on these three countries and, and, and next year it will be on three other ones and so forth. So, uh, and uh, um, we are not just focusing on Europe because as you can read, uh, there's been a, a webinar on uh, uh, in America on what's in USA, Canada, and, and Mexico in April, and it's on our website. You can uh, have a uh, watch it again, and there will be a forthcoming webinar uh, about what's going on in Asia and Australia in November. 
So, but this afternoon, so I, I, I welcome Henry Jeffrey from the University of Edinburgh, United Kingdom. We talk about what's going on uh, so in the UK. Uh, then Kim Nielsen from Rambo, uh who will uh, give the update for Denmark. And then Yago Torre Enrico for BMEP in, in, in Spain. And, uh, and Lota Pernima from Ocean Energy Europe will give the overall key statistics and trends from, for, for, for Europe uh, the, the, from, from, from the data that the syndicator, uh, uh, that European syndicator has gathered. So I give you the floor, Henry, and um, I think we will jump from one panelist to another. Uh, one after another, and I won't talk again before the questions. So questions that you can ask, uh, as you can see, you can you can type in questions, and and uh, we will devote then the 15 last minutes uh, on this, uh, on this topic. Thank you. Please, Henry. Okay. Thank you very much, Jan Henry. Just check that you can see my screen and hear me. Okay. Yes, we can. Perfect. Okay, thank you very much, Jan Herbie, for that kind introduction. As Jan Herbie says, I'm the UK delegate on behalf of Bayes for IEA OES. And what I'd like to do this afternoon is give you a brief overview of some of our key projects and policies we are developing in the United Kingdom. So the way I'll lay out over the next 10 minutes or so is, first of all, give you some high-level overview that we have in place. Then I will look at the underpinning development that we are running, some of the projects, some of the initiatives that we have, and then I'll finish off with a more of an industrial update of the projects that are happening on the demonstration zones and the demonstration projects that are happening within them. So first of all, beginning with our policies, at the highest level, at least at the end of last year, there are 10 a green industrial revolution. So the plan aims to mobilise over 10 billion of government investment and adding to that more than three times as much of private investment with the overall aim of creating 250,000 green jobs. Um, as part of this, then the wave and tidal sector is very interested in saying what will be the market incentives that will allow some of Happen. As well as having technology push, the sector is really needing the, the market pool to progress in the, in the UK. And the main mechanism for this is our contracts for difference or our CFD mechanisms. And I think it's fair to say that in the United Kingdom, all eyes are on what the progression will be with the CFD allocation, which currently is a very well designed process for the development of more mature technologies, but we're waiting to see if there will be adaptions made in rounds later this year to allow less mature emerging technologies, such as wave and tidal, the CFD in a more competitive way than we've been able to do in the past. So we really all are sort of pinning our hopes on having a secure, clear market signal. And I think organizations such as our lobbying organizations of Renewable UK, Scottish Renewables and the Marine Energy Council have really done an excellent job of bringing together the evidence to UK government as to why the sector is now ready for the market signal, for the market allocation to be put in. Moving then, then from the policies back to the underpinning research and development that allows those um, advancements and cost and performance to happen, I'll go through some of the organisations that we have. Our main underpinning research organisation is the URE Supergen Hub, funded by the, our Engineering and Physical Science Research Council. It's been funded with um, £5 million pounds of UK taxpayer money in 2018. As you can see, it brings together a number of the main UK universities led and coordinated by the University of Plymouth. Um, but as well as that, we also run within the programme what we call flexible funding rounds. And over the past two years, in 2020 and 2021, we've allocated um, 2 million of 
universities. And so you can see the list at the bottom of my screen there. And 20 other additional research projects have been funded. And that's really brought in a whole range of new players and actors from other sectors and other knowledge bases in the science sector to bring their knowledge to the wave and tidal sector. So I think that's a really promising initiative. And hopefully that will be renewed in the coming years. Speaking about underpinning research and how that engages with industry, our main national lab or our equivalent of a national lab is the OIE Catapult. It brings together um, the industrial base with the scientific community. And you can see the statistics there of the sort of the large number of industrial companies and the engagement that they've enabled with academia in order to make sure there is that good transfer of the work that happens within the supergen community and the underpinning scientific research base and make sure that that is impacted at an industrial level. Their main project that they run, or they run many projects, but the largest one is the Tiger project funded at a European level. It's the largest project of an interreg level that's been coordinated by the by the UK and will have significant deployment of tidal energy in European waters based on the program. Moving from tidal to wave, Wave Energy Scotland is our main initiative um, in the UK and Scotland. It's been running for just over five years now. Um, it's run a range of um, range of funding programs both in underpinning subsystems and in devices. It has funded more than 95 research projects to the tune of over 40 million and brought together 230 research organizations or research and industry organizations in fact across the lead with regard to sort of making sure that the wave energy sector um, can catch up with the progress in the energy sector. The of um, Wave Energy Scotland is not gone unnoticed by the world, with many other initiatives around the world trying to emulate it. And the European Union is one of those organisations that's success, and so has then funded, led by Wave Energy Scotland, or coordinated by Wave Energy Scotland on the path of the European Commission and the Basque Energy Agency, or in partnership with the Energy Agency, funded uh, a European version of Wave Energy Scotland um, to the tune of 20 million euros. They've been working very hard on the, the launch of that, and I know that they're working hard on it now with the aim of launching the, the calls early next week. So keep your eyes peeled for the announcement of the launch of the Wave Europe calls. Moving then to the more of the industrial focus of the, the test zones that we have, our test centres and the projects that we have in them. Um, many of you will know about our underpinning research facilities of flow wave and coast, the very sophisticated test tank facilities. A new facility that's coming soon is the facility actually based at the University of Edinburgh with Babcocks, which will be testing industrial scale tidal energy blades for the, for the sector. And we would then, of course, um, have our large scale test sites and test zones, EMET being the, the most famous of those, but others that you can see from WaveHub, FabTest, Morales, and Meta, all similar things. I think um, I have to give an extra mention to EMEC. I think EMEC is probably the most successful um, test site in the world now and remains the only um, fully accredited by the IEC grid connected full scale test site um, for wave technologies. Um, at WaveEC we've tested, sorry, at um, EMEC we've tested uh, a range of devices quite, quite, you can see a whole range of them here. And this is only uh, a sample of large scale wave, wave and tidal devices. And I'm just going to pick a couple of them and to finish off, off with to show the type of projects that are now being demonstrated in the, in the UK. So first of all, I'll mention the Orbital O2 device. I think I've seen this picture in more conferences over the past few months than any, any other picture. It's been launched from the port of Dundee earlier this year, Port Orkney, which will then be going under, 
on documenting and, and key trials there. So I think a great sort of success story for the sector of taking it to truly industrial industrial scale and thus then showing the real need for a market signal in order to take this from single demonstration devices into, into arrays. On the subject of arrays, again, uh, Edinburgh-based technology, Nova Innovation, they're launching their next tidal device in their existing array in Shetland, with plans for two other installations later this year and next year, taking this up to a six-device array and really being able to understand the interaction between um, turbines in an array setting in order to take the set sector forward. Moving back to, to WAVE, these are two next two projects I'll show you are both funded by WAVE Energy Scotland. I showed you their pipe systems that were enabling devices to be developed. So this is one of two main devices that have come out of the WAVE Energy Scotland programme. The first one is by Motion Energy, an Edinburgh-based based company. Their BlueX technology has now been transferred, built at full scale, transferred to um, Orkney, where it's undergoing some operation and operation and um, maintenance trials before it moves into more rigorous fuel sea conditions later this summer for fuel tests. The RR technology within the wave energy following fast on its heels technology based in, in in Inverness, and you can see it here under the last stages of its fabrication before being transferred to Orkney again later this year for testing at EMEC. So that's all I'd like to say on the technologies, but just before I wrap up, I would like to highlight that um, the UK and Scotland will be hosting the Conference of the Parties COP26 in Glasgow later this year. So the eyes of the world will be on Glasgow. We will be looking at saying what are the climate implications, what are the solutions. We aim to ensure the wave and tidal is, uh, gets a real focus there and gets highlighted as one of the solutions in order to combat climate change. So this is my final slide, but hopefully I've given you quite a whistle-stop tour of our supporting policies, our R&D institutions and our initiatives, as well as our test centres, the projects that are happening in those test, test centres, and some case studies showing the sort of large scale that we have in order to make sure that these technologies with the correct market signals can form part of the solution to net zero and at the same time providing those green jobs to be part of the just transition. Okay, thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to any Q&A in the, in the final session. But all the information and more I've covered is covered in these two publications that we've produced from the IEA and from my own group at the University of Edinburgh. Thank you very much. Back to you, Jan Herbert. Thank you very much, Henry, for this very comprehensive uh, presentation and, uh, and all this information. Now I give the floor to Kim. Uh, Kim Nielsen, please. Thank you, Ken Haver. And uh, I hope you can see my screen now. Yes, we can see it, but not in slide mode. So, now it's in slide mode. Yes, great. Okay. Thank you. And I will uh, then give an update from Denmark on ocean energy projects and policies. And I'm Kim Nielsen, alternate from Denmark. So the Danish uh, climate agreement has been uh, agreed uh, last year, and the, the aim is to reduce uh, carbon gas emissions by 70% in 2030 compared to 1990, and to achieve a climate neutral climate neutrality by 2050. Uh, as one of the steps toward this, uh, Denmark has uh, decided to build an energy island, as they call it, in the middle of the North Sea. Uh, it should be able to receive about three gigawatts of renewable energy from surroundings in 2030, and then it will be scaled up to be able to receive 10 gigawatts. Uh, and this, I think, gives a great opportunity for wave energy in the North Sea and for Denmark especially, since the wave resources are bigger when you go offshore to deeper waters compared to uh, 
connecting the, the energy with cables to the shore. So in Denmark, there's no real uh, official targets for, for wave energy. We have a partnership for wave energy, which includes nine, 10 active wave power developers. And since 2012, we have tried to promote wave energy to the government and the need for long-term support, uh, inspired what you heard about uh, Scotland and, and the, the, the way they do it uh, over there. However, we are still ongoing, and I will uh, tell you a little bit about the projects that are ongoing. And it's it is primarily supported by the EUDP, which is uh, a government support mechanism for uh, new technologies, and wave energy is one of them. Uh, and we have to compete with wind and solar and everything else. And then private companies support us, and Olpo University and DTU uh, takes care of the uh, more theoretical part of the development. And we have always in Denmark uh, tend to go of uh, five-step uh, development, starting in smaller scale, then gradually scaling up and going to the sea. And the aim or the targets that we have in the partnership is to gradually uh, reduce the LCOE and then build up the installed capacity and hopefully in 2050 be able to deliver maybe 4,000 4, megawatts of uh, electricity. So to test our systems, we have a test site uh, called Danbeck uh, and the, at the west coast of Denmark facing the North Sea. Uh, we are, of course, not as exposed as EMEC, but uh, as we are sheltered by, by the UK to a certain extent. But it is uh, still a very harsh and real environment for testing our systems. And it's very close to this uh, big harbor in Hanstholm, which recently has been extended. So there can be also uh, new developments uh, regarding renewables taking place over there. And but basically it is a fishing harbor and it has been that for, for many, many years. Uh, Wave Piston is one of the systems that recently have been testing at Danbeck for two years. It's a number of plates activated by the waves and then they pump uh, pressurized seawaters uh, that can be used for desalination or for electricity production. Uh, since this uh, last year, they have now moved to Plokan where they are uh, developing a bigger system and they, it will deliver power to the platform at Plokan. So that is uh, an exciting uh, development and uh, much of the learning they did in Hanstown, uh, they have brought to uh, the Canaries. Um, also floating power plant, which is a combination of floating wind and wave power plants to go to Plokan. And uh, one of the things that, that floating power plant look at is the, uh, the delivery of power to X. Uh, that is uh, a market that they uh, see in the future. And that is, uh, I think, not the only one. Uh, what they do at the moment, they, they test their device in a large uh, scale, first at Olbo University and later uh, ongoing, they are, have moved to Spain at Cantabria, where there's an ongoing test campaign at the moment. And at the same time, they have built a PTO test bench on land, where they can te test the full-scale power takeoff of their system on land and then uh, compare it to what's happening at sea. Uh, ExoWave is another Danish project, which is uh, uh, similar to Oyster, you could say, but it undersea activating pumps and they also uh, look at desalination and uh, power to x and similar to wave piston they pump a pressurized water to the shore where they then can process the the, the power further veptos another danish system looks a bit like solders uh, dock uh, the, it's it is actually the, the geometry of solders dock but mounted on two uh, arms which can then uh, change angle and depending on how big the waves are and they have tested it in a sheltered site on the other side of Jotland in Lillebelt where, where it's very suited for, for small-scale uh, ocean tests 
and they are at the moment looking for ways to develop this uh, into a bigger system. The same with Crestwing, they have tested a relatively large hinged bar barge in Kattegat, also on the uh, sh shelter side of uh, Jutland, and uh, they are they have had good results, and they they found out that when the waves came from Sweden, they would of course be bigger, and they are now going to uh, test it uh, in Danvik if they can find the funding and and scale up the PTO system for that part. Uh, for small scale, we have uh, Basin started working on Wavestar, but he then continued uh, developing a smaller heaving buoy that can produce power for powering uh, underwater measurement systems or uh, ROVs or, or things going on underwater. And uh, he has a project going on looking at that. Um, Finally, we have uh, the Concrete for Wave Energy project, which has been a cooperation between uh, Wave Dragon, this overtopping uh, device, which is supposed to be built in concrete, and also the KN Swing, which I have been involved in, uh, an attenuator with oscillating water columns could be built in concrete. So we have had a joint project together, and if you see my screen shaking, it's because the washing machine next door has started trembling. Finally, uh, Wavestar, uh, it has been tested in, in Danvik in 2012. The EXCO visited Danvik, and you see the, the group formed uh, around a, a star. It's not Wavestar, it's just a landmark uh, next to the Danvik test site. And along with the, all the uh, hardware, we also work on the numerical uh, wave energy model. A project under OES Task 10. We have a floating power plant, Olpo University uh, and DTU involved in this project and I'm then coordinating it. Uh, and yesterday we had uh, a webinar introducing a new uh, case that we're going to uh, model uh, in the team. So that is what I have to had chosen to say from the update from Denmark. So thank you. Thank you very much, Kim. You 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 gave us a, a overview of what's going on. Many many projects indeed, and, uh, and mostly on one of the two technologies we mentioned at the beginning, since uh, it's for wave. But that's really really interesting. And uh, so now I give the floor to to Yago. Please, Yago, can you tell us about what's going on in Spain? Okay, good afternoon. I think you can everybody see my, my screen. That's fully right. Yes, slide right. Mode. no problem. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay, it's a pleasure to have been invited uh, to take part in this uh, web, 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 webinar to share with all of the people uh, the, the, the status of the ocean energy in Spain. My name is Diago Torre Enciso and I am the Spanish delegate. Okay, the, the scheme of the presentation is more or less the same than colleagues that are taking part in this in this web, uh, webinar. And if I, if I have to summarize the Spanish state regarding ocean energy policies, I would point out uh, two things. First of all, there is not a specific legal or economic framework for, for ocean energy in Spain, but uh, there are some legal initiatives uh, paving the path for the development of this sector. The Energy and Climate National Integrated Plan for this decade is written, still to be approved, and on it, uh, ocean energy has a specific targets, and that's good news in general. Looking at this uh, plan and, uh, and decrees that are being approved uh, during the last uh, couple of years, everything is preparing. Uh, an easy way of doing for uh, R&D projects. Uh, it means mainly less red tape and, and some new economic uh, support tools, but still to be defined. Uh, the special maritime planning draws no area for ocean energy uh, pri uh, prioritary area for use, but establishes uh, no restriction for R&D projects. It means that you can try to promote uh, at any place 
uh, an R&D project, always fulfilling the existing legal frame in that site. Uh, but it recommends uh, to use the established R&D test sites. Uh, there is a roadmap for the development of offshore wind and ocean energies in Spain that passed a prior public consultation process, but uh, its development apparently is in a standby period. Uh, and a new uh, climate change and energy transition law was approved last month, and it uh, establishes uh, climate neutrality for uh, 2050 regarding greenhouse emissions, and neutrality uh, means uh, reduce and compensate. Uh, and at a regional level, the Basque Energy Strategy uh, for this decade sets also a target, a regional target for, for ocean energy, in this case, uh, wave energy. Uh, as I uh, said at the beginning, in Spain, there is no specific market incentives for ocean energy. In general, the Spanish mechanism for the development of re re renewables uh, is the auction. It means uh, the competitive public tender process. Uh, even, those, uh, even though those competitive tenders started being uh, technologically neutral, uh, everything points to a small tender focused on emerging sectors and as uh, ocean energy in the short uh, term. And uh, regarding public funding programs, there are several national and regional funding programs uh, to support R&D and demonstration projects. Mm, but uh, when it comes to ocean energy, only two of them are focused on ocean energy. On one hand, we have the Ocean and Ocean Net Co-Fund that is reaching the, the final of its period, and possibly uh, it will suffer uh, changes to be adapted to Horizon Europe and the demonstration support program uh, that every year is launched by the Basque Energy Board to support a uh, testing phase at BIMED. Okay, let's pass to talk about R&D activity in Spain during last year and this year. Uh, there are several European projects in, the, in, in, the, in development and I have to I have to recognize that I didn't want it to choose too much avoid, uh, between them to avoid hurting uh, any, anybody. And that means that now I am going to show uh, them quite quickly. Apologize for that. Uh, first, uh, a couple of projects focusing on uh, the development of, te of, of technology. Uh, we have DTO and Plus focused on new tools at the design phase that is coordinated by, te by Technalia, and they are uh, developing an integrated uh, open source suite of tools. And uh, Valid, a uh, H2020 project that is developing a hybrid testing platform for accelerated testing. Uh, changing a bit the focus of, of, the, this, of, the, of the project, now to the design of a specific subsystems. Uh, NEMO, the project NEMO is an H2020 project again focused on improving the design and performance of tidal turbine blades. Uh, there are 12 partners, uh, five of them are from Spain. And C Titan, uh, an H2020 project coordinated by the Spanish company Wedge Global and focused on second generation direct drive power takeoff. We move again the focus of the project and now to make easier and more profitable from a quite knowledge point of view. The Marinet 2 is an 2020 project that finishes at the end of this year. And there are some 40 uh, partners, seven of them are from Spain. And Blue Gift, an interreg Atlantic area project that joins uh, the best practices from 4C and uh, past Interreg North Atlantic project and offering testing at Cineo, France, Wavec, uh, Portugal, and Plocan and BIMEP, Spain. Okay, let's move again the focus of the projects now on removing non -te technological barriers and more exactly the, the potential environmental impact on, uh, of ocean energy. 
we are uh, taking part in this uh, West project, an internet project, collecting and processing environmental data from three wave energy de devices installed at Spain and Portugal. And uh, again, trying to change the idea of uh, ocean energy as an environmental risk. Uh, Safe Wave, a project funded by the European Maritime and Fisheries Fund through IASME, uh, that try to go deeper in the work done at WESE, the previous project I saw. Both projects are coordinated uh, by. Okay, let's pass the focus on business. Uh, we have to talk of LB Plus, uh, coordinated by the Basque Energy Cluster. This project is working on collaboration of seven European clusters to position Europe uh, as a world technological and industrial leader on blue energy. And we reach the uh, Europe Wave uh, project that uh, Henry has, has shown uh, pre uh, previously. It's a three-phase competitive program of uh, R&D under the frame of a pre-commercial pro pro procurement that will end with three prototypes in the water with the support of European Commission, uh, the Basque Energy Board and, and Wave Energy Scotland act as a buyer's group of public authorities to bring these three te technologies from TRL4 to, to, to TRL6. And Ocean Energy Europe is also a partner of this uh, project. Uh, as the last activity on R&D, uh, we have to talk a bit about the Harsh Lab. That is an advanced floating platform lab, lab, laboratory when, when, where you can test the evolution of, of the behavior of materials against the, uh, the corrosion of the biofouling. It's the, by Technalia, and they are working now in a second version that hopefully will be in the water at the end of this, of this summer. Let's pass to talk a bit about technology demonstration projects. And uh, even though it's a bit a classic in this in this field, we have to, to, to talk a bit about the Chico Wave Power Plant that was inaugurated in July 2011 and since then has been up and running and injecting electricity to the grid. And during this year, uh, the milestone of two gigawatts have been uh, passed. I think that is the, the wave power plant uh, that has produced the most energy all over the world. BMEP as a test site uh, promoted by the Basque Energy Board and, and the Spanish Energy Agency that is in operation since July 2015. And uh, the, the nowadays situation is that in, in the first cable, uh, they are hosting uh, the hash lab. In the second cable, in of weeks is going to be fully deployed uh, a device developed by Huelo and a, a, a Finnish company and is going to be installed uh, in, a, in a joint work between uh, Huelo and Saipem. It will be there uh, hopefully a couple of years. In the third cable they are going to use it for, for testing a floating wind device. And in the fourth cable, the Wales company Marine Power System is working with their uh, dual sub platform in the first step uh, acting as a wave energy com converter in a second step uh, adding on the top. Uh, Plocan, the, the test site uh, developed in the Canary Islands. Uh, offers also a, a good uh, place for, for deploying devices in the field of ocean energy and wind energy. And during this uh, 2021, they are going to deploy uh, by uh, uh, a floating wind device. They are working since the last year uh, with wave piston and they are uh, following this, this trial during this, this uh, summer. And uh, the project Boost, Boost, that is a floating PV project that is going to be deployed during this during this year. A new a new company is a new test site has been approved in 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 Galicia, in close to the external port of uh, La Coruña, but it still have to be developed. 
And uh, talking just a bit about uh, tidal energy, we have to point out that Magallanes Ren 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 Renewables uh, has been deployed again at IMEC after being transported to for maintenance and, and um, refurbishing a bit. And just to close my presentation, I just wanted to show uh, or to, 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 to share the news of uh, ICOVID 2022 being hosted at Donostia San, San, San Sebastian in the Basque Country in Spain. It's going to be organized uh, by the Basque Energy Cluster in collaboration with Technalia and BIMEP, and it will happen uh, October uh, 2022. Thank you for your attention. That was everything I wanted to share with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thiago. There was much to say about what's going on in Spain. And uh, we will meet, of course, in San Sebastian uh, next year. But uh, I want to give the floor now to Lota uh, to uh, really give us uh, statistics about what's going on over all Europe, because we've just heard about three countries and you have more to tell us now. Thank you very much, uh, Jan Hervé. Thank you for the invitation to um, tell you about the key trends and statistics and industrial developments from last year. My name is Lotta Birtima. I'm from Ocean Energy Europe. That's the Industry Association for Ocean Energy, a network of ocean energy professionals. We have members from uh, developers to research institutions, regions and ut utilities, uh, among others. So um, last year was of course, challenging for many sectors, ocean energy included, but the sector really showed its resilience and many deployments uh, happened and uh, other industrial milestones um, were achieved. Challenges. So, um, if we look at the tidal stream sector first, uh, we saw 260 kilowatts of tidal stream capacity installed in Europe last year. And uh, while this is less than what's previously planned, uh, projects were not cancelled, but they were just postponed from last year to this year. And some of the deployments already have taken place, as we can we have seen in the other presentations. So the total capacity of deployed tidal stream in Europe is almost 28 megawatts. Of these, 10 is currently operating and the rest has been uh, successfully uh, completed their, um, their testing programs and they have been decommissioned. And um, if we look at this graph, you can also see that Europe is still leading the tidal stream uh, deployments. Um, and the global number of tidal stream is 865 kilowatts that was added uh, last year. And um, the electricity production in Europe hit the uh, 60 megawatt hour mark, which is a great success, taking into account that, of course, access to, to the devices and workshops was uh, difficult due to several lockdowns. So this really shows the robustness and the resilience of these uh, currently deployed projects uh, that can produce that kind of uh, power even with reduced maintenance works. And here in this curve, you can also see that it's increasing exp exponential. So that's already a good sign for the sector um, as well. So uh, in total, the tidal stream sector in Europe produced 12 megawatt hours uh, in 2020. Um, moving on to the wave, the wave um, sector, uh, 200 kilowatts of wave was installed in Europe last year, and that brings the total capacity to 12 megawatts, and a bit over one is now deployed again because of the project have have been successfully completed and decommissioned uh, after the testing programs. So as with the tidal sector, uh, projects were not cancelled, which is a very good sign, but just postponed uh, to this year. And we're looking forward to several um, several deployments later this year. And um, here in this graph, you can see as well the annual and uh, cumulative, cumulative cumulative European and rest of the world um, installations. And while the uh, number of 
uh, devices so uh, the installation has been reduced a little bit over the years this is because the developers are at the moment preparing and manufacturing devices for next set of projects so they're preparing for those uh, full device full scale device and pilot farm projects so of course it takes time to to manufacture all those devices and prepare that but uh, many interesting and in, uh, exciting projects are coming online this year and in the years ahead uh, then looking at some industrial milestones, uh, European Tidal Stream and WAVE uh, developers have been successful in getting public and, and private funding and one uh, new um, or crowdfunding has become a very uh, popular way of raising equity for European developers. And um, the sector is also preparing for industrial uh, production. So the Swedish title developer Minesto has um, um, established an assembly hall in Wales. Core Power also from uh, Sweden has established an R&D center in Portugal and ENI and Politecnico di, di Torino have established uh, a research lab um, in Italy to support ENI's uh, uh, deployment of the first wave energy pilot farm in the Mediterranean. Uh, European developers have also secured new export projects. For example, CMEC Atlantis has a project in Canada, uh, in China, sorry, and Japan, where they um, indeed commissioned <clears throat> a turbine early this year. And um, SME has is continuing their pilot farm and Nova Innovation um, also announced a um, pilot um, farm project in Canada. And on top of these industrial uh, developments, the policy framework has, has really uh, picked up in 2020. We already saw that in, uh, there are targets for wave energy in the National Energy Climate Plan, uh, also in Portugal and Ireland. And in the UK, as Henry mentioned, uh, preparing or planning the, the next round of the, uh, the contrast of uh, difference for uh, tidal stream included. And at EU level, the Commission published an EU offshore renewable energy strategy that has key provisions for ocean energy. And for the first time, the EU sets deployment targets for wave and tidal energy. So 100 megawatts by 2025, 3 by 2030 and 40 by 2050. So these are very good signs uh, for the sector. And finally, my last slide, uh, looking into the future, uh, what deployments will happen this year. Now, these numbers here are from the publication. So at the time of writing, um, we didn't know all the uh, projects that will happen. So these are a bit conservative because we've already seen uh, O2 deployed as we uh, as we saw, and there are also other projects uh, planned to be deployed um, this year. So looking forward to the next few months and the, the coming years really for these new deployments. And thank you for your attention. And back to you, Janere. All right. Thank, thank, thank you very much, Lota, for all these uh, figures uh, and uh, I guess it hasn't been so that easy to collect them in 2020. How did you manage to do that? Uh, well, we have this um, kit in the water database that we update when we get information during the year and then at the end of the year we, um, we, do, we consult uh, European and also outside of Europe uh, developers to to produce these numbers and indeed if any developer would like to uh, um, be included in the report for next year uh, don't hesitate to contact, contact us and we can uh, include your installation information there thanks mm -hmm. uh, i guess uh, henry kim and Yago, could you so please your your set uh us on because now uh, we still have uh, a couple of minutes for for for, for questions and uh, um, 
I don't see many in, in, in the chat or elsewhere, but uh, I, I'm still. Uh, uh, um, we you haven't much talked uh, one or the other about the LCOE. However, the LCOE it seems to be related to the uh, installed capacity. Um, and you've shown installed capacity uh, on your respective, also for Europe. But um, how can we, can we manage, in fact, to, to go uh, faster on this installed capacity in order <laughs> to uh, to get uh, this LCOE getting down? Uh, um, what kind of initiatives? Because we've shown many initiatives, and how can it how can it go? It's an open question for all of you. <laughs> And, and I'll maybe start this off here, and others can jump in, Jan Hervey. I think it's having the, the right balance of, uh, of policies, because although I stressed in my presentation the real need for a market signal and market pool mechanisms in order to start you know, meaningful scale deployments in the, in the sector, I, I think that we don't want to sort of stop the technology push policies at the same time. So in order to ensure that we do drive down that um, cost reduction curve as efficiently and effectively as possible, ensuring we have that market signal to get deployment, um, but also having those technology push programs still being at the same level or higher as they were before to make sure that we can improve the performance, reduce the cost, improve the reliability so innovation does not stop just because we've started to roll out at a large scale. That, that would be my view. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, from, from, from my point of view, the, the question of LCOE is, is a bit uh, soon to, to to talk about that in 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 wave energy, maybe regarding tidal energy, we can try to promote, uh, uh, let's say, uh, the first uh, demonstrations projects, uh, looking at, at uh, the reduced cost by doing a bigger and more number of devices. But in uh, talking regarding wave energy, I think we still are uh, in the face of. Uh, Reaching uh, so much from the techno uh, technological point of, of view, because they still uh, have to demonstrate that they are able to survive, they are able to produce energy during a uh, bit more than a couple of years. I mean, it still have to be work at at that phase of of prototyping. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, from from my point, I, I think I agree with with Iago that it is a bit early to talk about the LCOE. But I've, of course, as we do in the OES, we can make projections on 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 a technology and say, ex assuming everything goes fine and and all these problems are solved, we expect this LCOE. That is, of mm -hmm. course, uh, maybe different from from one uh, technology to the other. But in general, I, I think that tool to, to look at the LCOE is, is valuable, even if we cannot reach that until we have shown that it can work and it can survive and it can mass produce and everything. Uh, and of course, you also see that the teams who do deploy their system at uh, C learn a lot and then develop new uh, ideas and, and new approaches to, 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 to overcome some of the challenges. It is important to keep on having uh, things in the water and uh, encouraging uh, that development. Okay, thank you. I think Another, everybody. Maybe. Yeah, everything uh, was said already, but I would just add that as we've seen in, in the wind industry or solar industry, once we get more uh, deployments, that's when the costs go down. So that's what we need. We need uh, large and large demonstration projects um, that will really demonstrate the technology um, and create those valuable learnings. So that's what we need and um, support for that, uh, you know, market market pool mechanisms that that would be really most needed actually. okay then i see some questions arriving in and uh, coming in and uh, there's one about uh, do ocean energy europe and ocean energy systems formally work together 
to prioritize research on ocean energy. Um, do we work together? Yes, we've been working together, and, and uh, that, that, that's of course uh, something uh, very pertinent to do. Um, uh, and uh, I think that's throughout some uh, European projects. In fact, that some of our delegates are, are really uh, taking part and exchanging uh, um, our, uh, their, 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 their views in order to uh, to, to, to uh, uh, this prioritization. Uh, maybe Henry, you could tell more about that. Uh, or thinking about ATIP and all these things. Yeah, no, I, I think that there are several levels to um, the collaborations and how the collaborations could happen in the future. I think there's, you know, the formal collaboration and with Ocean Energy uh, as an or, as an organisation. Um, so that's a, the sort of formal collaboration um, level. But then I think within the the membership of um, of the IEA Technology Collaboration Program, OES, then there are lots of examples where the members of OES are collaborating with Ocean Energy Europe, either in, in projects where Ocean Energy Europe is acting um, as a coordinator or leading the dissemination and, and impact, or indeed the, the example you gave of the European Technology Innovation Platform, where a number of OES members um, with Ocean Energy Europe helping to set those things. I think the question you mentioned was about setting research priorities and topics and the uh, ETIP program or the technology, European Technology and Innovation Forum produces the strategic research and innovation agenda that lot of leads that has a number of um, OES members leading that technology prioritization work to feed into the policy guiding work that Ocean Energy Europe does. Thank you. Um, there are some other questions where we uh, we are a little bit uh, over time, but I think it's worth uh, trying to answer to these. Uh, one about Europe Wave. So I think uh, you were both uh, Yago and Henry talking about it. And uh, will it be funding projects outside the partner countries? As far as I know. <laughs> <laughs> as far as I know, I think that it, it's it's possible to have uh, uh, pro pro proposals uh, coming all over the, the the world because it's a it's a public uh, purchase, a public pro 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 uh, procurement. Then any any anybody can take part on that. But on the yeah, other uh, side, I it's, 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 it's a fun. Yes, yeah, sorry, sorry, Henry, please. My understanding is that the you know any European um, country or organisation is is eligible um, to to lead a pro to lead the project. So any country in Europe will be able to to join, not just those from Scotland or Spain. And indeed, any, as Iago was saying, any country in the world can also join. Um, and I think there is that there is the limit that they cannot lead the project, but they can be a uh, uh, a partner, um, a sort of a subcontractor, right, as long as they are below a certain size of subcontractor. Right? Okay. okay. Then I have a question, I think it's for you, Henry. It's about uh, the contract for difference in December 2021. Uh, there any idea of what will be, what it will be for Tidal uh, and Wave? Any, any hints? Uh, it's the question, it's a really good question, and it's the question that I can't answer, but it's a question that everybody would like to know the answer to. What I would say is that, and I mentioned in the presentation, is that there has been very structured, professional, coherent information provided from the Marine Energy Council to give all of the evidence to, to base in the contract for difference team, the information they need about the maturity and the potential contribution of the of the ocean energy sector and so we just need to wait and see how that will unfold with regard to what the uk government is doing. so it's, it's a good question i don't have the answer but we're all hoping for a very positive outcome there okay uh, then i have two more questions the, the one about the, the risk of competition in the near future between ocean energy and offshore wind and notably floating and uh, while 
in, in, in the presentations from, 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 from Spain from, uh, and also from Denmark, you talked about floating offshore winds. So uh, it, is it uh, complementary or in addition? Uh, yeah, it, I think it's complementary. Uh, at least uh, the floating power plant, they have both on the same platform. Uh, and and this uh, ratio of, I don't know, uh, it's a little bit more wind power and a little bit less, basically 50-50. It, it seems to be a good combination. But it can also be uh, floating wind or offshore wind in general combined with Wave power seems to be a, a good mix because waves are a little bit out of phase with the wind and it gives a more stable energy production. That's at least uh, what we have learned in the past. Okay, and theoretically, even though they are, uh, there are several uh, synergies among them, uh, on the other hand, I think that they are going, to, in, in, in some when they are going to compete for the space. But at the same time, maybe uh, from the uh, visual impact point of view, they can uh, some sol 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 uh, solutions can become the best in a place and not the best in other places. Then, okay. Mm -hmm. Henry, you want to add something uh, about this? Yeah, and uh, just shortly, because I realise that we're we we're, we're over over time. I think that certainly our experience in the UK that um, that you know we used to have competition from the supply chain with regard to you know accessing contractors for the ocean energy sector. You're competing against more lucrative contracts in the oil and gas sector. That that's no longer the the same um, situation it was was before, and we're now seeing that there is um, competition for say vessels or surveying for offshore sites that there is competition coming from the offshore offshore wind sector. But I think that that's a, a short term um, competition as the sectors develop. And I would like to think that in the medium to longer term there are very useful synergies with regard to the grid infrastructure, the ports and harbors infrastructure that can be developed strategically together. And as Kim was saying there about the about the balancing um, more and more renewables added into the energy mix, and there's much more intermittency um, of our of our energy supply. Then having renewables complement each other in the balancing market will be extremely important. So I think there is a real sort of um, opportunity for complementarity there, although perhaps some competition for the uh, short term. Okay, thank you very much, Henry. Now I take the last question, which is about uh, how can OES support the acceleration of certification of marine energy converters? Um, would like to talk about uh, maybe the international guidance framework, uh, the, the guidance framework, because I think it's one step in that direction. Would like to talk more about this, maybe you, Henry, again? Um, yeah, I can add something. Add something just that. Um, the um, IE um, or IEOES um, in collaboration with Wave Energy Scotland and the European Commission and the US Department of Energy have brought together a guidance document or the framework for the development of um, Wave and Tidal in, in Energy, which looks at saying what are the metrics that you need to have in place in order to move from certain stages of, of innovation from like the early stages of tank testing through to medium scale developments, through to large scale developments, and having a real agreement as to not just what you need to achieve, because in the past you might have said you had to have tested the, the device in a real sea environment, but this is what that um, information is saying, okay, if you have to successfully test it in a device in a real sea environment, what is the duration, what is the performance, okay, you need to have expected to have achieved in order for that to be a successful test. So that will allow the information to be very transparent to the, both the public and private investment communities at an international level. So there can be transfer of, of technology internationally. So a technology 
coming into Europe or European technology going to Asia or, or North America, the investor can really see the information that or the information or the level of maturity of innovation that's been achieved in a much more transparent way than, than it has before. So that document has been released, it's been trialled by most of the OES member countries now, and then a collaboration with the IEC, the International Labs Technical Commission, to say if that's successful, to transfer that, that document into the future into the IEC IC program as an official standard. Yeah, yeah. I think I would like to, to, to compliment Henry in that uh, that many of the OES uh, initiated tasks, wherever possible, with the IEC, uh, the standard committee, uh, that for example on, on model scale testing or uh, Okay, and also in the benchmarking of uh, of numerical models, that's uh, also something important. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you very much. I think we're over time, and it's time to 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 wrap up. I have to to to, to thank you all for your excellent presentations, so, Lota, uh, Yago, and Kim, and uh, and thank you also for all the participants, and thank you for Webec also. Uh, have enabled uh, this uh, this webinar because of course uh, uh, this doesn't come like this i mean <laughs> yeah, yeah, there, there are some organization and technical issues before before getting this and um, if i can still show uh, my uh, my screen uh, just to recall you that there will be uh, as i said another webinar um, on this ocean energy outlook but this time about asia on asia. So maybe in another time slot in the day uh, to, to, to be better fitted for, 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 for this part of the world. Um, uh, but uh, so I invite you to, uh, to join at that time and, and also to uh, watch again uh, if you want. Uh, so uh, uh, the, the, the previous seminar, uh, webinar on uh, what's going on in the US, uh, Canada, Mexico. Thank you all, and I uh, hope to see you and uh, maybe in San Sebastian next year as you invited us. Uh, yeah, go. Thank you. Thank okay, you. Thanks. Bye bye. Okay, thanks.